we're going to another extremely exciting topic and one that's very dear to my heart as well. Um, and I want to welcome the moderator for this conversation um, on stage. Joanna God Gordon is an exceptional global executive and she has been included before, so she's returning. So you've made a good job convincing her that's a fantastic space. And she's one of the most remarkable C-level uh, persons and like global thought leaders in AI. Um, she said I shouldn't tell too much about her. She can say a few more words, but like Google her, it's pretty impressive. And we hope she comes back many times to Cluj. So please welcome, introduce your conversation, your guest. Thank you very much for coming. Please give Thank her a big you. round of applause. Thank you. Well, actually, really, our highlight today is Jayden. So I'm going to invite Jayden up onto stage. Uh, Jayden is the chief architect at the BBC. So he's in charge of everything that's a technology uh, and architecture direction of the BBC. And I think you've really been, your mission has really been how to transform the BBC into a much more data-driven organization and how do you think about AI and ML and uh, implementing that across the organization. So before we start, I'm gonna ask everyone really quickly, do you mind standing up? Stand up. Thank you. Raise your left hand, right hand, sit down. Perfect, a little bit of moving around in your seat to really be, you know, focus on uh, our conversation. Welcome to Cluj. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, so I don't know if most people are aware of how big the BBC is, how old the BBC is. You're about to turn, I mean, not you, but the organization 100 and about, in, uh, you're 97 years old this year. Um, do you want to sort of give us a quick overview of the firm? And also the question I want to ask you is, is there something particular about your culture that has allowed you to constantly reinvent yourself and innovate in order to still be around almost 100 years later? Yeah, that's right. So we are almost about 97 years, uh, which is fantastic, right? Um, having that much of legacy and, you know, backstories is, is always useful. Um, BBC, as many of you will know, um, obviously is very much known for um, news, but um, we started our journey um, back in, you know, 1922, 24. Uh, with radio. So radio was a medium through which we used to connect with people, citizens, and everybody else around the globe. Um, and, you know, our main purpose is inform, educate, and entertain, uh, which we still continue to deliver to, to the purpose. Um, in terms of the way we go about re reinventing uh, ourselves, um, I've been with the BBC for four years. I'm still newbie, by the way. Um, but I've been told that we've already reinvented twice in the past. So obviously we started our journey through radio and radio was the main medium through which we used to connect uh, with people. Then came television, which was a big transformation in itself. Huge amount of obviously resistance around um, using television as a medium. Um, but then we got out of that and me now television is the main medium. Obviously radio still continues to be the, uh, the one. Um, and then again, internet came, right? Um, and, and we started that journey. We were the first one to launch um, online iPlayer um, back in 2007 when iPhone was just launched. So again, we started our reinvention journey and that reinvention journey hasn't stopped. In fact, it's only getting um, you know, bigger and bigger. So what makes you a little bit different from some of the other broadcasters or some of your competitors? Because I mean, when we look at the, the competitive landscape, we're really talking about from the Netflix and the Amazons today to, you know, traditional uh, Fox and U uh, Universal. I mean, it's, it's a quite a, a broad group. Um, but what's very unique to you is the public service angle. Do you want to, so, and that I think has been driving a lot of even, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I think it drives a lot of the decisions you're making as you're looking at AI uh, and how you're looking at implementing AI. Do you want to sort of? Yeah, touch? that's right. I think I'll start by saying that the way BBC is funded, um, so BBC is funded by what we refer to as license fee within the UK, uh, which, is, which means that if you, if you have a television or if you watch any kind of television, you, you have to buy a TV license, which is almost about 142 pounds a year or something like that. So that's unique because it's publicly funded and it's there for public. It's not government led. It's not driven by any commercial organization, which means that any of our programming will not have any adverts. 
Um, so that's a fundamentally different um, way um, the BBC is funded, which I don't think there are many organizations out there. Um, what's unique about us? I think the unique thing is that um, our position is about putting facts to the audiences rather than taking position about any topic, be it health, environment, or anything like that. Um, our job is to make sure that you know, the, the audiences are aware of the facts um, rather than actually take a position on that. So with that in mind, uh, and I think it really came to highlight to, to a lot of people when we saw the last US presidential elections, this whole flurry of misinformation, disinformation. Can you share with us what, you're, what the BBC is doing today, how you're using AI and machine learning uh, to influence, you know, or, or how AI and ML are being used to influence media and society and what you guys are doing specifically to try to counteract that. That's right. So AI and machine learning, as we know, any kind of new technology always has a huge amount of opportunity, but at the same time, there are lots of risks as well. Um, so the angle that we're taking is, at the moment, AI and machine learning has been used to influence audiences in all sorts of different ways. I mean, we refer to that as disinformation or misinformation, and in some cases, synthetic media as well. What that means is that the information that is presented to the audiences, there is a huge amount, or potentially, there is manipulation behind the scenes, and there is no clear way of verifying whether the content is accurate and can be trusted or not. So one of the biggest challenges that we have is BBC's story put out of context, as an example. Um, BBC's presenters uh, have been modeled into digital tween, twin, and they've been used to say whatever they want. So those are the kind of big challenges that we have behind the scenes. The way we are trying to tackle them is by first of all convening a debate, because this is actually, yes it is about technology, but it's more about raising awareness um, about these kind of issues and actually doing something about it. BBC in itself as an organization can't deal with this alone. It has to have participation and collaboration from different parts of the industry, the government, and, and the technology organizations. So, I want to maybe sort of t take t uh, divert the conversation to a slightly different direction, uh, and we'll get back to this though, which is for a lot of firms today, it's how do I start my AI journey? Um, and the BBC, as being a 97 year old organization, has a lot of data. Uh, many people say that is, you know, the essence of uh, ML. What, what's, where did you start that journey? Where are you deciding uh, what projects to undertake? How do you make those decisions? Uh, do you sort of want to walk us through how a large organization sort of embarks on this journey? And also, where do you think you are on that journey? So first of all, um, you know, any kind of innovation in large corporate is very, very hard, as we all know. Uh, we have about 25,000 employees, and, and it's not that easy. Um, I think um, our, we started a journey about five, six years ago, so BBC tends to um, run ahead in terms of researching on certain topics. So AI and machine learning has been a topic that we've, we've been researching on, and specifically what it means for the uh, media and broadcasting industry. So we started our journey about five years ago. It's all about starting small and large corporates, actually having enough evidence that there is something that, that we need to deal with. Um, interestingly enough, we started by tackling our data problem. We didn't start by um, looking at what the opportunities with machine learning and AI might be. Um, even though we would s assume that we have a huge amount of data, we actually don't. Um, there's data in our content, but we don't have access to it. So extracting data about our content, um, about our audiences, uh, was, was our first, uh, first step. Um, and again, it's all about doing basic things, basic things in terms of personalization. Uh, recommendation as that, that you know, we all expect um, from most of our service providers. And in some cases, they become very frustrating as well because they don't tend to recommend you the things that you actually want to um, watch. Um, the other angle that we also took was uh, we have something called editorial policy, uh, editorial guidelines that s about 6,500 journalists across the globe use to make sure that the article that they write, the content that they produce, actually fits the guidelines. We're trying to codify that guidelines. Um, in a way that um, if we were to deploy some sort of machine learning capability, the machine learning service actually had awareness of um, the editorial guidelines as well. 
So when you do that, you're directly going to your editorial board and saying, I believe a machine might be able to replace you one day, potentially. How do you overcome the barriers or the, the, the pushback internally? That, that's exactly right. So it's all about starting by educating um, what this actually means. It's not about replacing, it's about augmenting um, skills. And I think that's what we believe. Machine learning, I, we don't believe, will replace the, the knowledge and the experience that the journalistic community and editorial community have gathered over the years. So it's all about actually going through the process of identifying the opportunities and what the machine learning capability will enable them to do that they are not able to do right now, uh, but also raising the awareness of the risk associated with us not doing anything about it. So are you, did you, are you doing specific, edu you know, how are you bringing everyone, educating internally everyone? You're a 20,000-person organization, so how do you make them aware of the risks and the opportunities, uh, reassure them that this is going to facilitate your day-to-day your -day job or it's going to enable you to do things that you can't do today? What's that? internal process? We, we apply our own approach um, to ourselves, which is storytelling, right? So we, we host uh, many conferences, many fireside chats, uh, specifically with our editorial community and um, our, our journalistic community. Every year, uh, we bring experts from the industry, from universities, um, um, technology organizations who have been working on this domain to raise awareness to the extent that last year, uh, we had on BBC4, we had a series on if AI was to take over the um, take over Channel 4. Um, and what was interesting about that was that there was a process behind that, which was the editorial community were able. You just wanted to sort of explain to everyone what happened, because it was, if I remember correctly, it was like a four hours or of, of uh, shows that were totally designed, yeah. but, you know, you want to just sort of. Yeah, so, so we, we as, as you can imagine, we have a huge amount of archive content. Um, so what we did was we basically built a small algorithm that, will, that would basically crawl across our archive. And, and obviously, BBC4 has a particular content type and genre type. Um, and depending upon those characteristics, um, the machine learning bot was able to sift through all the archive content and bring out and actually suggest a program uh, over, over 24 hours. Um, on what type of content at what type of uh, what time slot and so on and so forth So that was quite interesting um, in the sense that the editorial teams were, had to actually rethink the way they were Going through uh, making sure that the right programming is out there But that that's one of the ways we, we go about actually educating and bringing awareness within the organization as well so one of the big challenges big organizations or companies often complain about or, or is the challenge in getting talent, getting strong AI talent to the organizations. Can't compete with the salaries of the Googles, the Facebooks. Um, what are you doing to, I mean, you're, you're building, your team's getting bigger and bigger, so what's your secret sauce? I, I mean, we can't compete on salary. We are public service, so we cannot attract talent based on salary. Um, what we can um, bring to the table is belief and purpose. Um, our strong emphasis at the moment is about reinventing our public service in, for the next generation. So we have a very, very strong uh, belief around what the public service needs to be going forward. And we do bring together talent from different parts of the world um, who actually have similar belief or share similar values. So belief and purpose is, is what is driving us so far. But at the same time, you know, the market is very, very uh, fragile. Um, uh, you know, at the moment, we have about 20% churn uh, within, within the uh, tech community at the moment. What about, I read somewhere that you are, you actually are developing your own, your internal training people up skill-wise. So has that been sort of your decision that we've got certain skills in-house and we're going to develop others and that's the path we're going to take? That, that's absolutely right. Um, we know that we can't attract talent. So what we've done is about a couple of years ago, we started a training program um, that started with basic machine learning 101 to advanced machine learning and so on and so forth. Um, and in the last you know, 18 to 24 months, we've been able to train about 500 of our software engineers and editorial and journalistic communities as well. Um, and now we are building 
a leadership program that is focused around um, technical leadership in this particular domain. Um, this allows us to actually um, you know, build collaboration outside of BBC and at the same time give those individuals the opportunity to learn more. Because you also have very, very strong partnerships with eight, nine leading academic institutions. Yeah, so that's the other way we actually attract talent. So within the UK, we have um, eight universities that we partnered with called the um, Data Science Research Partnership. Um, and that partnership allows us to not only tap into the talent um, that's coming out of the universities, but also we are able to provide industry-focused opportunities for those um, individuals as well. Just to sort of help, you know, we're talking, you know, frame, frame it a bit. Do you want to sort of maybe share an example of an actual project you're working on today and maybe highlight the things, sort of the, the challenges you've had to deal with in implementing? So I'll use the one that, that, that we all are aware of, recommendation. Um, recommendation within uh, media and broadcasting is interesting, particularly for BBC. So um, personalization is a journey that we've been on for many, many years, but I don't think we've got it right. Um, and personalization with an editorial twist to it and uh, editorial guidelines is much harder. Um, so we're focusing on not just providing you recommendations about the content that you might be interested in, but actually things that you might not be aware of and might not be interested in is as well part of that recommendation, uh, which becomes interesting because what we want to avoid is audiences um, you know, being part of a bubble. We want them to come out of a bubble um, every now and then, like we do through our programming um, through television as well. Um, so that approach and recommendation is very different to, you know, based on what you've um, consumed, we will recommend you X, Y, and Z. And keeping you in the same. Keeping you on the same kind of um, uh, echo chamber in a way. Um, so the editorial guidelines actually play an important role. Um, and we have editorial teams collaborating with our data scientists, data engineers, and software engineers on how to go about um, training the algorithms so that they're able to make these kind of judgments. Um, if, you, if you get a chance, um, tr download um, what we call BBC Plus, which is a very trial, basic, small application, a mobile app that actually gives you a flavor of the, what that recommendation looks like. Great. Um, I think we have just a few seconds left. What would be your parting words recommendation to anyone who's embarking on their digital transformation and AI uh, journey? Keep it small, focus on, um, I think, um, smaller use cases and scale up. Um, you know, don't jump into big, big kind of use cases up front because there's a lot that you can learn by starting small um, and then actually prove your, build some credibility for the, within the organization. Great, well thank you very, very much and I hope everybody enjoyed and got some amazing insight because it was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. Hey.